Brilliant. Um, so, talking to you tonight uh, about the role of the first resource on scene at a major incident. So, I've called the presentation First on Scene, Bringing Calm to Chaos, uh, because obviously that's exactly what you need to be doing if you find yourself in that unfortunate position of being that first person or the first crew in attendance at a major incident. So, hopefully, tonight's webinar is going to provide you with a, a useful refresher of how you can bring some calm to that chaos. At the Manchester Arena Inquiry, Sir John, the Inquiry Chair, identified and acknowledged that the reality of current pressures being faced by the UK ambulance services means that it's unlikely that there will immediately be a large number of ambulance resources available uh, to attend a potential major incident, which will lead to a delay in deploying to scene the required number of ambulance commanders and resources to resolve the incident. So as part of this, he acknowledged the importance of that first ambulance clinician on scene in undertaking the role of the acting operational commander, where they're going to share situational awareness and adhere to the Jessup principles to enable effective and prompt triage of all casualties to commence. And my further motivation for wanting to speak about the actions that should be undertaken by the first crew on scene at a major incident stem back to a number of headlines which first made national news in May 2021 after Patrick Ennis, the first paramedic in attendance at the Manchester Arena bomb, gave his evidence to the public inquiry. So uh, a lot of you will recognise this headline and similar. Uh, this one was taken from Sky. I think there were some BBC uh, headlines as well that have since been removed. Um, and these news outlets initially directed their criticism towards this, this particular individual. Uh, but it was later acknowledged in writing that the actions he'd undertaken had been in accordance with his training. Uh, and ultimately, the actions that he undertook remain aligned to the actions that we would follow should a similar incident happen today. So he was first on scene. He didn't treat any patients. Um, he focused on establishing that initial command and control structure, gaining as much information as possible to feed back to, to the control room and kind of looking at how we could move forward to, to enable a, a safe working environment to begin that casualty treatment. To understand the role of the first crew on scene at a major incident, it's really fundamental that we understand the parameters set for the declaration of a major incident. So historically, there have been several slightly different definitions um, of a major incident because the impact of each incident is different for each separate responder organisation. Uh, a couple of years ago, to promote joint working, Jessup established uh, the definition of a major incident. And this is widely accepted by responder agencies across the UK. Uh, and that definition is an event of situation with a range of serious consequences that require special arrangements to be implemented by one or more responder agency. As an NHS funded organisation, the ambulance service, the ambulance services across uh, England also have to consider the NHS EPRR framework definition, uh, which in 2022 took into account the Jessup definition uh, and also expanded upon it to include the impact of the incident on, on the wider health community. Uh, and they sort of, they've added in that in the NHS, this will cover any occurrence that prevents serious threat to the health of the community or requires such numbers or types of casualties as to require special arrangements to be implemented. So this was the, the EPRR framework's definition. So this is a, an NHS ambulance service. This is what we would work towards. Um, and again, as an NHS funded organisation, the ambulance service has retained the major incident standby status which was removed by the, the wider Jessup community. So this is something that comes up when we're delivering Jessup training quite frequently around the fact that the ambulance service have retained the standby status. And this in part is because the ambulance service is seen as that gatekeeper uh, to the NHS in the event of a major incident uh, and that wider organisations may need to begin to make uh, some arrangements uh, proportionate to the scale of the incident. Uh, it's also helpful to remember that what constitutes a major incident for one service doesn't necessarily meet the threshold and sometimes doesn't come anywhere near that threshold for a major incident for another agency. But that the declaration of a major incident by one service should be shared across relevant responder agencies. And I'm using the term responder agencies rather than uh, emergency services because uh, Jessup should be looking to incorporate all the different agencies that are involved in incident response. So as well as the, the kind of traditional four emergency services we're thinking about your Category 1 and Category 2 responders under the civil contingencies at your local authorities, your national highways, and the utility companies, etc., who may have some involvement in the incident. So types of major incidents. When we talk about major incidents, um, the types that most likely uh, are going to have a, an immediate impact on operational ambulance personnel are uh, those rapid onset incidents, which may include elements of CBRNE and hazmat or mass casualty incident. 
So that will put the incident types on the screen for you to read. And these are the types of incidents that NHS ambulance services are required to ensure that their operational staff are prepared to respond to at no notice. So a rapid onset incident uh, could be a CBRN or a hazmat related incident. There could be a mass casualty element to it. A mass casualty, we talk about hundreds or thousands of casualties. Uh, but much of the preparedness um, that's carried out by trust EPRR teams is to ensure we can respond to those other types of incidents shown here and included in the EPRR framework. So thinking about your pand pandemic illnesses, uh, so they'd be a rising tide incidents. Uh, and in addition to that, the ever increasing threat that's being posed um, to our cyber security. And the most recent of these incidents uh, took place in July, affecting an ambulance service or multiple ambulance services. And this was the denial to the MobiMed electronic patient record software used by a number of ambulance services across the south of the UK. So the ambulance service uh, on the whole has a statutory duty to, to prepare for all of these different types of incidents. But the vast majority of the training and preparedness that we give our operational staff is for that, that rapid onset or what we used to call a, a big bang type incident. So driving and arriving. So it's likely from the information that you've received that you know you're going to be attending an incident with the potential to be significant or even major. Uh, and this is likely to be an anxiety inducing event for, for most, if not all people. Um, and it's important to try and organize your thoughts on the way to this incident. You might have limited information initially. So we're considering what information is available and you may be getting requests of multiple people um, who are wanting uh, an early update from scene. If it's looking like this incident is going to be a major incident or really significant, then you may have your operational commander who's going to want an early update, uh, the uh, control room duty manager, potentially the control room team leader, maybe a tactical advisor or a NILO. All these people are going to be really thirsty for that, that first sort of methane or ethane message that you're going to deliver from scene, sharing that situational awareness. A really good way to manage these requests for information, making sure that you don't sort of overload your lines of communication is by suggesting the use of an open speech incident talk group. So allowing all users on the channel to hear your initial methane message. And I'd really recommend this as a good idea sooner rather than later in an incident. And if it's something that you can get established or request to be established on the way to the incident, then you're going to be in a really good position when you get there. Um, and your initial messaging is going to be available to all the relevant people involved in the wider incident response. And it's certainly something that I request as part of my own practice. Where are you going to park? So this is uh, perhaps a little bit more important than it first sounds. So uh, thinking about where you're parking, we should be trying to park as close to the incident as possible, ideally adjacent to any identified police and fire service control points, and ensuring that where the risk assessment dictates to us uh, that we're uphill and upwind uh, of the incident as well. In relation to parking, it's worth remembering that we are the only service who need regular access and egress from scene to ensure patient flow can be maintained. So giving consideration to this uh, early on is, uh, is really important, making sure that the ambulance loop is there so we can get in and out uninterrupted. If you're the first resource on scene, you're going to be leaving your blue lights on to identify you as the, the ambulance forward control point. Uh, and you should also be leaving your keys in the ignition uh, to enable your vehicle to be moved if you do become separated from your crewmate. Uh, at this point, some services advocate passing an initial windscreen report or situation report back to the control room uh, and looking at the, the kind of national guidance. Uh, there's no, um, not particularly prescriptive as to which format this should take, but uh, common sense would dictate that the methane or the ethane message, just a really brief um, situational awareness report back into the control room at this point uh, would be a, a wise idea. So then before we get out, we're thinking about what PPE should you be wearing. So that's going to be dependent upon the type of incident. And it's important that you undertake your own dynamic risk assessment. But I'll probably say for most incidents of this sort of nature, high vis and helmet is the, the kind of minimum level uh, major incident uh, PPE that you should be looking towards. And then your dynamic risk assessment is going to be an ongoing process that commenced at the time you received the incident through. Um, and you need to ensure that the scene is safe enough to enter at this point. And what I mean by that is that the level of residual risk is an acceptable one. So you have in place any actions required or you've liaised with multi-agency partners to ensure that they're providing those mitigating actions for, for any particular risks that have been identified. 
So thinking back to your duty of care that we have as an ambulance service, we have to accept a, a level of residual risk when we're moving forward, uh, but it's down to, down to the ambulance service commander. Uh, and that initially is going to be you guys who are first on scene. It's down to you guys to, to kind of think about that mitigation, how we can make it safe so that we can, uh, we can approach the scene to assess it and begin to treat patients. So expectation versus reality. You, you're going to be faced with a potentially chaotic scene with conflicting information. It's going to be emotive. Um, you're going to have to attempt to decipher a lot of this information that's coming into you quite quickly uh, and deciphering this information, understanding what's fact, um, so what's intelligence versus, uh, versus all that information that you're being told. Um, that's going to allow you to undertake your role more effectively. And it's likely to be compounded by, compounded by conflicting information. Uh, and in fact, the Regulation 43 report that was issued following the 7-7 bombings in London referred to an inevitable level of chaos at an incident. But the expectation, the public expectation, is that one of the main roles of the emergency service is to, is to create order out of such chaos, which is partially achieved by establishing the facts or the intelligence surrounding the incident. Uh, so what's required of ambulance service responders here? So to achieve success as the first ambulance resource and scene, we need to make a rapid change in our mindset. So this is from the volume two uh, Manchester Arena Inquiry report, and it's an uncomfortable reality of mass casualty incidents that for someone in the position of the, the first ambulance resource on scene to start to provide treatment will risk the overall response and is likely to cost lives and not save them. So it's that change in mindset. So as ambulance clinicians, we're used to working autonomously where we're supported by guidelines and shared decision-making where necessary. But ultimately we're autonomous clinicians but at a major incident, we need to shift to that command and control mindset, including taking a step back and not becoming uh, personally involved in patient treatment initially, uh, however difficult that may be. So do not attempt your rescue or treatment of casualties, which is included in all your first resource on scene action cards, on all of your um, operational and tactical command action cards. So it's about taking that step backwards and just making sure that we're maintaining that situational awareness rather than getting dragged into to treating one or two patients and losing sight of everything else. So priorities on scene then. So we know that the priority of the first ambulance resource on scene is not to focus on providing that direct casualty care, uh, but instead should be around um, identifying and declaring a major incident or potentially a major incident standby. So most uh, ambulance trusts allow any operational member of staff to declare a major incident. So within the trust I work in, uh, this is encouraged that all staff have that awareness that they've got the, the authority to do that. The declaration should be provided as early into the incident as possible uh, and could in fact be made in the control room subject to sufficient information being shared. Certainly the one, one or two specific incident types where potentially a major incident could be declared um, from the control room before we even have any resources on scene. Operational staff should always be encouraged to declare a major incident if they believe that they're in attendance at an incident that they feel meets the threshold. Uh, and the rationale for this is it's far easier to stand down the response a short while into the incident rather than trying to stand up a response much later into the incident, which would result in a delay in care and potentially lengthening, lengthening that care gap time between the incident taking place uh, and the emergency services in particular the ambulance service being in place to, to kind of begin to provide um, casualty care. So next next priority is that initial declaration and sustained situational awareness which needs to be shared with the control room. We've already discussed the initial confusion and chaos that you're likely to face as the first ambulance resource on scene. Uh, and it's vitally important that you uh, make an initial scene assessment to provide this situational awareness back into the control room. Uh, so this situational awareness should take that methane format, which hopefully everybody on, on here is, is familiar with. That's something that people have seen before. And we'll talk a little bit about that on the next couple of slides. Um, and that methane message should be shared with all other responder agencies. So the control room should take that message and share that with all other responder agencies and that will build what we call the common operating picture so that all services from a control room perspective have the same understanding of what's going on on scene. And then the further key to success is to follow any issued action card. Um, so really heavy weighting is placed on adhering to these action cards. 
um, and we do have national action cards in, in England. Um, it's likely that you'll be following the first resource on scene, uh, major incident action card, um, and it allocates you as that acting operational commander until you're relieved by a suitably trained operational commander. We'll talk a little bit more about those action cards and why they're important later on. The overall aim of, of any response to an incident is to save lives and reduce harm. Uh, and this starts with you as that first resource on scene. So the early deployment of 10 second triage, um, which is going to commence those life-saving interventions early. So hemorrhage control and airway management, really important and 10 second triage, which is coming to all uh, emergency services across uh, certainly England um, over the next couple of months uh, is going to allow us to do that. So to share that situational awareness, uh, the first resource on scene is going to send a, a methane message through to the control room. And it's accepted that this initial methane message is going to be brief, but it is going to set the scene. It is going to start to build that common operating picture across all the responder agencies. And it's also going to be really useful to help shape that initial response provided by your own agency. Um, most, uh, if not all, ambulance services will have a predetermined attendance or a, sort of a, a guidance as to the resources that they're going to deploy to a major incident. Um, and using this methane message will allow the, the service to kind of declare that incident and stand that response up. For incidents that fall below the major incidents uh, threshold, I still advise staff to, to use that ethane message. Uh, and by using that ethane message, we're building it into muscle memory. So if you do find yourself in an incident where um, you, know, you are wanting to, to potentially declare it and you're familiar with passing a, an ethane message, gathering that information in that structured format, then, uh, then it is going to be a little bit easier. So going through the, uh, the methane report then, so the, um, the major incident declared or standby, we've kind of discussed the thresholds for the major incidents and, and considering standbys. We're certainly doing that earlier into the incident rather than later. The exact location of the incident, so this is potentially just confirming the address that you have been sent to, or using, uh, you know, for example, a what three words type app to provide a more accurate location. And I think most control rooms have, have what three words integrated into their mapping. Uh, your type of incident, so your type of incident, including brief details um, of types and numbers of uh, you know, vehicles, trains, buildings, whatever this incident is uh, involved. Hazards, uh, so your actual and potential hazards should be briefed here. And initially this list might be, might be quite brief, um, but you should also be trying to include your, your kind of mitigating actions there. Uh, access and egress. So access and egress routes need to be considered to maintain patient flow uh, and consider the need to establish an RVP, an ambulance parking point or a rendezvous point to manage the flow of vehicles through, uh, through these scenes that you're managing depending on kind of how access is and what sort of space you've got available on scene. Uh, your number of casualties is initially likely to be an estimate. Um, and then emergency services, you're wanting to state both those services present on scene and those that are required. And again, the Manchester Arena inquiry made reference to the absence of the fire service in the first sort of two and a half hours of the incident. Um, and they said that at no point did anybody list the services who were present. And they hope that by doing that, it may kind of trigger somebody to, to identify that someone who really needs to be there is missing. So methane can be updated as many times as necessary throughout the incident, um, as I've already kind of alluded to, that uh, should be shared um, through ambulance control to other agencies' control rooms. So you no limit to, to the number of times that you update your methane report, and certainly control would rather be uh, kept appraised of the situation um, while they're, they're waiting for a dedicated commander to arrive. There's an official Jessup app. If you haven't seen it, uh, I suggest you take a look at it and download it. Um, and this acts as a bit of an aid memoir when developing and passing a methane message. Uh, but it's also uh, got a helpful reminder on there for using different types of airwave radios, including changing channels if we are wanting to move on to a talk group. Uh, it provides some response principles to a CBRN or MTA incident, including the, the latest CBRN update around the removal of the step one, two, three. three the inclusion of the crest tool and bad colds uh, and 10 second triage is also uh, also up there as well uh, so i definitely advise uh, downloading this app onto your phone and just using it as a, an aid memoir so we've arrived on scene 
We've parked appropriately. We've donned our PPE. Our driver's waiting with the vehicle. They're our communications link. Um, we've carried out an initial scene assessment and we've passed our methane message. Uh, a few other services have started to arrive on scene. So what else is there to think about at this point? Bearing in mind that you're still the acting operational commander. So as the acting operational commander, you're going to need to co-locate with commanders from other agencies. So co-location is the first just at principle, and ultimately it's the, the kind of underpinning principle for a really effective on-scene response. By co-locating, it's forcing you to communicate, to look to coordinate that response, share situational awareness, and build a joint understanding of risk. Uh, and you'll get a co-locate, uh, a dedicated forward control point, or an FCP. So this FCP is going to be an area that's, that's been identified as suitable for uh, tri-service commanders to meet. Uh, and in the early stages, that's probably going to be going to be the first resource on scene. Um, and again, just agreeing the timings of those meetings and kind of when you get to meet there is uh, is really useful. So once you've uh, rendezvoused with the other emergency service commanders, uh, you may need to identify suitable areas uh, for carrying out triage or areas for grouping patients together. So these areas are casualty collection points or CCPs. So a CCP can be an improvised or a notional location. Uh, so for example, it could be a CCP in the corner of a car park or the stairwell of a building. And the whole idea is it's somewhere safer to move patients where they can be overseen by a clinician, re-triaged as necessary, um, and sort of life-saving and some bridging interventions carried out. Uh, you might also need to identify a casualty loading point so we know that your most seriously injured priority one patients um, are more likely to survive if we get them off scene uh, ASAP. So rather than delaying them at, at CCPs and potentially casualty clearing stations as well, we want the focus to really be on getting, uh, getting those priority one patients away from scene. So identifying a casualty loading point early uh, is going to be really useful. Um, so thinking about your casualty loading point and your ambulance parking point, um, you need to give consideration to that ambulance loop. So we need to make sure that vehicles can get in and out of the incident uninterrupted uh, to enable uh, to enable that smooth flow of patients uh, to and from hospital. So once you've identified some of these key points, and they're going to depend, vary kind of depending upon the, the incident type, um, you might also need to identify uh, what we call some functional role officers. Uh, so functional role officers sit below commanders in that, uh, in that kind of command structure and functional role officers have a specific coordinating responsibility for one particular area at an incident. So um, the, it's, it's really, really difficult to be prescriptive about which functional roles should be allocated first uh, because the exact functional roles that you get to require and the order in which you require them will depend upon the nature of the incident. But when you are allocating people to undertake tasks, the focus should always be on saving as many lives as possible and minimising risk to responders. So one of the roles that we're putting up here is primary triage. So this is the person who's going to oversee uh, what is soon to be 10 second triage, uh, coordinate that 10 second triage of casualties, uh, which is going to be the universal triage carried out across all emergency services. An ambulance parking officer, um, a pretty underrated role, uh, but a really vital role in the response because your ambulance parking officer is kind of going to maintain that ambulance loop. They get a liaise with your loading officer. They get a brief any oncoming crews as well. So they get to tell the oncoming crews exactly what's going on about any specific hazards that there are um, and make sure that that ambulance loop can continue uninterrupted. And then safety officer as well. So the last webinar that I delivered was around ensuring sort of scene safety. Uh, the ambulance service duty of care and the role of the safety office is a really vital one um, for, uh, for for pretty much any type of any type of major incident that we respond to. Uh, but there are loads of other roles that we can we can kind of talk about. And for each of the functional roles, there is a, a specific action card uh, for all of these individuals. On there, I've just shown the, the ten second triage algorithm for anyone who hasn't seen it. Um, it's available uh, widely online. It's on the Jessup app as well. Uh, and this is uh, this is what primary triage is going to look like, hopefully by uh, April 2024. 
So this is what you're going to be directing your primary triage officer to coordinate. You can see the focus is all around providing those life-saving interventions and identifying those P1 patients who are going to need really rapid transport to hospital. So hopefully a bit sooner than having done all of that, but depending on where you work, maybe not, um, you're going to need to brief the operational commander. And the recommended format for this is the II March briefing structure uh, that's advocated by Jessup. It's certainly not the only briefing tool out there. It's certainly not um, you know, the quickest to, to kind of knock together in, uh, in, in a minute or two uh, when you see that, that commander arriving on scene, but it gives you a little bit of structure. So information, so reporting the key facts using the methane model. So you can just use your, your existing methane template here. Intent, what are we trying to achieve? It's unlikely that a strategy is going to be set uh, by the strategic commander at this point. So we're simply working together to save lives and, and reduce harm. So method, how are we achieving what we're doing? So what, what have you put in place so far? Have we got any uh, functional roles allocated? What areas of the response are they looking after? Um, administration, thinking about who the commanders are, if there are any at that point, what PPE is required or being worn at current, and are there any welfare issues or arrangements in place? Risk assessment, so this is reflecting the joint understanding of risk and should include uh, mitigating actions as appropriate. So what have you already done uh, about those risks that you've identified? Communication, so are we using a multi-agency or a single agency talk group? It would likely be a single agency talk group. And I would hope that your operational commander would already be on this talk group, but just confirming with them the, the uh, exact talk group that we're using, any call signs that have been agreed, uh, and what the plan is for those interagency communications. Are we having Jessup meetings every 15 minutes? Um, you know, how frequently are these Jessup huddles taking place and where? And then humanitarian issues and, and human rights. So thinking about information sharing and human rights. Uh, and probably um, sort of lower down at this point when you're handing over to the operational commander, there's probably not going to be a huge amount that you're talking about in there because the focus is going to be around Article 2, that right to life um, of the patient who, who their right to life is already compromised. So therefore, we've got a positive duty to act, uh, which hopefully by this point you will be doing. Uh, so action cards then. So... Why do we use action cards? So major incidents, uh, low frequency, high impact events uh, with potentially far reaching consequences. Uh, most staff are likely to only have limited involvement in basic training and responding to a major incident. And the use of an action card can prompt staff to undertake the correct course of action. Uh, action cards will reduce the likelihood of human error as well. So if you're first on scene at a major incident, your bandwidth, that's the kind of mental capacity that is required to deal with any given situation. It's going to be stretched due to the vast amounts of information that you're likely to be receiving uh, and the enormity and the potential impact of such a situation. And also because your, your channels of communication are likely to be overwhelmed with, uh, with not only ambulance service responders, uh, but also other agencies looking at you to provide support and advice at the forward control point around that ambulance service response. And by following an action card, uh, it will hopefully prevent you from emitting any essential actions. And then functional role action cards. So you could be asked to undertake a functional role. So as an operational member of staff, after you've been relieved by the, uh, the operational commander, uh, you may be asked to undertake a functional role. So this could be anything from casualty liaison officer to ambulance parking officer or another really important coordinating uh, function at an incident. And it's unlikely that you'll have received any training for undertaking such a role, unless you are a trained commander or perhaps you're part of HART or SORT, the Special Operations Response Team. And the action card will act as your guide until hopefully you're going to be relieved by a trained officer, because the National Command and Control Guidance states that people are um, able to undertake a functional role um, with no training as long as they're following the action card. But the kind of gold standard is that um, functional role officers should be undertaken by, uh, by trained individuals. So this action card is just going to give you the awareness uh, to undertake this role alongside hopefully the briefing that the operational commander will give you. So nationally, there's the NARU, the National Ambulance Resilience Unit action cards that are provided to uh, all NHS trusts. 
uh, on NHS ambulance trusts. And I think dependent upon your service, it may be commanders that are issued them or they may be uh, available on all, all vehicles for, uh, for ambulance personnel. Um, the cards can be the first resource on scene, the subsequent resource on scene. So there's, uh, there's action cards for, for those individuals. And then action cards for commander LC, your operational, tactical and strategic commander. There's cards there for your command support roles, so your national interagency liaison officer or tactical uh, advisor, your logist or your command support assistant, and then your functional roles as well. So those coordinating roles that, uh, that we've kind of discussed. So this was a recommendation that was made at the Manchester Arena Inquiry. And again, this is volume two of the report. And this was recommendation 71. And it said that the National Ambulance Resilience Unit, uh, amongst others, so the, uh, the Police Chiefs Council and the Fire Chiefs Council, should oversee the development and implementation of action cards for the ambulance service for use in a major incident. Uh, now, at the time, there were action cards that were already in place um, on a national level, uh, but they weren't necessarily used by all commanders. Uh, and this recommendation is ensuring that all control room staff and commanders are trained in the use of action cards and making sure that action cards act as a checklist, setting out the key functions of each command role and the role of control room staff and really emphasising the need for joint working and making sure that those action cards are available for people to use and that they're tested regularly. Um, so if you haven't currently got access to action cards, then I'm sure that will probably be something that, that will be happening shortly within your, your own organisation. Um, where action cards are present and mandated and, and importantly accessible, they must be used. So the Manchester Arena Inquiry Report said that commanders must use their relevant action card during the management of an incident. And this requirement was not observed by all NYS commanders during their period of command, but it should have been. Uh, and these action cards, they're, they're provided by the National Ambulance Resilience Unit. They oversee our interoperable capabilities, uh, things like heart, as well as command and control. They set the standard that we work towards. Uh, so where they've provided a document for us to follow uh, around the management of an incident, then uh, it should be followed um, so far as so far as is possible. Uh, and again, just emphasising the point that action cards are an important aid memoir uh, and taking into account the stress of a, a mass casualty incident. Uh, and again, the NARU Command and Control Guidance version 3.1 uh, uh, references action cards heavily throughout and it's expected that both commanders, including those people undertaking that uh, initial acting operational commander role and functional role officers will use them. So to summarize, major incidents are low frequency and high impact events, and there'll always be initial confusion and chaos. Uh, your role is to establish the facts uh, and to reduce that chaos. You need to maintain your focus on establishing initial situational awareness and command and control and avoid getting drawn into individual casualty treatment because you will lose, you will lose sight of everything else that's going on. Your early priority needs to be to deliver life-saving interventions to as many casualties as possible using 10-second triage. And as the initial or the acting operational commander, that's not going to be you delivering those interventions personally, that's you directing the resources on scene. You need to allocate some functional role officers to support you as soon as you have the, the people available to do that, whilst also striking that balance of, of evacuating those P1 patients from scene. So if you have identified you only have a small number of P1 patients and you have some ambulances available, it may be more pertinent to, to evacuate those patients. So if you found yourself in that situation on your own, um, use the, the trust, the organisation's command structure to support you. Um, you know, accessing uh, advisors or commanders uh, who are going to be able to support you with that decision making. Uh, and then arguably, most importantly, use your action cards. So thank you very much. That's all from me. Uh, and I'm happy to take some questions. I'll hand back over to you, Andy.